Okay, so uh, the recording. Uh, okay, so it works. Okay, so Giovanni, please start. Thanks, Evgeny. Thanks, everyone, for coming to this talk. Um, I want to present a joint uh, result with Ma Magdalena Boss, who is also here. Uh, and uh, the title of the talk is The Generations and Extensions. of symplectic and orthogonal river representations. So the title of the talk is the title of also of our joint paper within on the archive and uh, wants to recall the celebrated uh, celebrated paper of uh, Klaus Bongartz called the, on the generations and extensions of finite dimensional modules and um, the motivation for us to study such a problem so symplectic and orthogonal clear representation has two sources one is uh, uh, the generic flag varieties. The second motivation comes from a study of the orbits of N2, SP, when and and two of O n. So, <clears throat> so there are two motivations for us to study the problem I'm going to present. Um, so let me <clears throat> sketch the idea of the motivation. So for for uh, one, we with Evgeny we consider a family. Giovanni, uh, could you please yes. recall what is n two? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to, but N2 is just the, the set of uh, two nilpotent matrices in the Lie algebra of the symplectic group and the orthogonal group. Okay, thank and you. And we set the, the, the Borel axis. Thank you. And once we want to understand the, the orbits. So for one, um, one has uh, the universal pure Grassmannian over uh, The representation variety of this uh, equivalent pivot of type A and D is uh, n plus one, n plus one, n plus one. <clears throat> and the fiber are the fiber over a point M is uh, the pure Grassmannian of dimension vector E, where E is one to N. And uh, so this family is very interesting because the generic fiber is uh, the usual complete flag variety of type A. And then we studied in a joint paper with Evgeny, Gislen, uh, Marcus, and uh, Fan King. Um, what are the other the, 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 the other points, the, the other fibers? And then we describe the degenerations of this map, and we call that a linear degeneration of the complete flag variety. Oh. And now the, the 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 question is how to extend this to the symplectic and the orthogonal case. So it's a very simple question. And uh, the first thing is to understand. Well, it's, it is clear how to define this family in that context is uh, I'm going to recall it, but uh, it's, it's if you look at the problem, you look at what you want to be the generic fiber, then it's clear what, what is what is this family. And uh, now the problem is uh, downstairs, the degeneration, the, 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 the order, the, the, the generation order is not known for the symplectic and orthogonal case. 
So this, uh, this problem, this theorem that I'm going to present wants to fill in this gap. So we want to describe the degeneration order for symplectic and orthogonal representation of this quiver here. Of course, I, I didn't define what are symplectic and orthogonal representation, but uh, just a motivation, okay? <laughs> and then for the second problem, um, <clears throat> This, uh, this, this problem of describing B orbits of two important symplectic and orthogonal matrices is, tra is translated into a problem of <coughs> the generation order for symplectic and orthogonal representation of, a, of an algebra. Which is uh, something like this. It's, So it's um, <clears throat> like a type A equivalent quiver with uh, two n plus one vertices. And then there is a little loop on the central vertex. And the relations are that alpha square is zero and also BA is zero. <clears throat> so there is an algebra and um, this algebra has self-duality and certain, for, for a certain dimension vector, <clears throat> the orbits corresponds to the B orbits of the loop. I mean, that's uh, somehow the idea. And uh, once one, one wants to describe the, the generation order for this, uh, for this algebra with self-duality. Okay, somehow it's... Uh, <clears throat> but in both cases, the situation is the following. There is a X, some uh, <coughs> complex algebraic variety, which is acted upon by a group G and uh, <coughs> X is endowed with an involution and G is endowed with an involution sigma and uh, the set of fixed points for this involution acts on the set of fixed points here there. So sigma and delta are two involutions. And in both cases, one sees that the sets of fixed points of G acts on the set of fixed points of X. <clears throat> and then now question, so, so question is, Suppose that X is a fixed point in X. <coughs> is it true that the orbit of X by the small group is nothing but the orbit of X by the big group intersection with the set of fixed points? So, <coughs> and the second question, does it hold for the closure? And then there is a yes. question. So your sigma and delta, they are so sigma involution on G and delta involution on X. Is what you're exactly. saying? Exactly. Oh, yes, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And they are compatible. <clears throat> so the the um, just one second. Um, so think of the following classical situation. And compatible means that G sigma X on X delta. Is that right? Uh, I'm going to tell you. Just ah, okay. Okay. Yes, okay. yes, but that's that's basically it. So <clears throat> for example, think of the following situation. X is um, the set of important n times n matrices um, and then take uh, delta 
so that uh, the set of fixed points lies in the in the algebra of this inflected group SPN. <clears throat> so it's an important form. And G is just GLN. And G sigma is this inflected group. <clears throat> so you mean delta and sigma are just standard involutions defined exactly standard involution so that the the sets of fixed points are the symplectic group and the symplectic algebra uh, okay okay then um, there are classical result of uh, gerstein Haber and Esseling saying that uh, the answer to question one and two is uh, is actually true is yes Answers is yes, in both cases. <clears throat> so what they show is that they are the 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 orbits are parameterized by um, by symplectic partitions, and uh, one orbit is in the closure of the other if the symplectic partition is obtained by the other by pulling down some squares, <clears throat> right? You know that so. And so they, they have to show that there is a one parameter subgroup sending one element to the other one. And uh, this question can be formulated in a more general context. So like here, so X and G are, so the general problem is the following. So suppose that, So here I'm going to tell you what is comparable. So delta of G of delta X is equal to G sigma X. Yes, so that's the compatibility that I require. So, so that's the notation for the action of sigma. And that's the notation for the action of delta. <clears throat> okay, so that's the compatibility. Then the second, and then there are three hypotheses that I'm going to put that, uh, that holds obviously here. So G is uh, the is a subgroup of the group of invertible elements of uh, finite dimensional associative algebra. Giovanni, I'm sorry, I'm asking yeah. about, about the first. So the, the first probably just means that delta and sigma are commute. Is, is it true? So I mean, uh, delta is an involution, right? Yes. So, if you put it on the right, then you get delta sigma of gx. Yes. Is uh, delta of x. Yes, 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 exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, they commute. But you don't but you don't take g sigma on the left, do you? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, so it's, they, they don't commute. There is no G sigma here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this, uh, so you, you don't need this sigma. Yes? No, no, no. There is no sigma on the left. OK. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. So the second hypothesis that I want to put is that G can be realized as a subgroup of, inverti of, of the group of invertible elements of uh, finite dimensional algebra.
So for example, GLN is the <coughs> set of invertible elements of the matrices n times n. Third condition is that the anti-involution, so G goes into G sigma inverts. This, so this goes from G to G, extends to a linear involution on E. So there is a, a linear involution such that the restriction to G is precisely this. So it's G sigma inverse. <clears throat> uh, and here is uh, clear that that holds. And then the fourth condition is very strange. Giovanni, I'm sorry, what, what is this involution for GLN? Uh, it's just, uh, so here, uh, so here the condition is something like for GLM is G goes to G transpose JG. Or maybe transpose invert, something like this, where J is the, the anti diagonal matrix with uh, one and then minus one. It's, it's something like this. And then, so. So the anti involution is just. Uh, what is it? Uh, is. Uh, uh, is uh, oh, yeah, yeah, no, this is inverse. So it's equals G means something like that. It commutes with J. So that, um, Isn't it a diagrammatic involution? Uh, it's the involution uh, induced by this J is the anti the anti diagonal uh, matrix with one and minus one. <clears throat> but, uh, but isn't this the same that is mm, uh, after Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You can choose also the other one with the identity and minus the identity. This is what you're saying. Okay. So probably the so just confused. So the, why you want G go to G T inverse? Uh, okay, wait. So let, let's work this out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what is uh so in uh we take C N and then here we fix the linear form X. Y to be X transpose J Y, where J is zero and then one and minus one. Okay. So this means that A E one with E two N is equals to minus one and E two N with one fa is one. Okay. All right, so yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. So now, what is uh, being being an isometry with respect to this uh, means uh, that G transpose J G is equal to J. Okay, which means that uh, G transpose uh, J. Yeah, yeah. J Jg is equals to G transpose inverse J.
Yes, so probably, do you mean that uh, your uh, involution? Oh, yeah, 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 uh, uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah. So it's G goes to J, G transpose inverse J, yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, yes. And, uh, okay, so j just, and then why, why do you need inverse? So, I mean, in your third uh, condition, so you say that you map G to G sigma inverse, right? So the, the third condition. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Okay. Why, why do you need this inverse? Okay, because um, because I want because because I want to remove this minus one because I want this to extend to the whole here. Uh, so so here the condition is that uh, what is it? Uh, Uh, J G transpose J G. Yeah. Yes. So then you take the inverse. Yes. Uh, so this would mean that. Uh, so so in your second line. Yes, on this board. Yes. Uh, so you take first. Then you inverse, and then you, you indeed get. Yeah, so, so the inverse is G uh -huh. goes into J, G transpose J. So that's, uh -huh. that's this one. I see. So otherwise, you're not getting something linear. Is that the. the otherwise, it's not linear, exactly. Yes. Okay. Otherwise, it's not linear, and, uh, and it's not defined on the old matrices. Okay. 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 Yes. Yes, yes, sorry, I didn't prepare carefully this detail. But as I said, it's very easy to see that this is satisfied in that case, just, and then there is a four condition. So I'm writing a theorem here, which is not due to myself. So for every fixed point, take a fixed point, so take a symplectic matrix, and then require that the stabilizer in G of this fixed point. So this is a subset of G, which is a subset of E. And this must be the group of invertible elements of its linear span. Of the span of this stabilizer. So there is this condition, which is also in this case, please trust me, it's very clear that it's satisfied. So it's uh, because in that case, this, the span is, uh, well, okay. So, okay, maybe I didn't convince you. But anyway, the theorem that is a lemma. John, I'm a bit confused. Yes. So what do you mean by span of stabilizer? So the stabilizer is a, a subset of a vector space E, finite dimensional oh, vector space oh, E. Oh, oh, oh. Then take the span of this vector, this, this, sub, this set, Mm -hmm. And then you want that in this span, the only uh, invertible elements are precisely those which are in the stabilizer. So you mean, so in principle, uh, this set of invertible, so let me see. In, in uh, principle, uh, the invertible answer can be bigger, mm -hmm. can be I bigger. See. I see. Okay. Okay. I see. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, Mike Weimar Zelinsky. They show that in this case, with these four hypotheses, then it's true that for every fixed point, uh, the orbit of x by the small group is 
precisely the intersection of the orbit of x by the big group with the set of fixed points. So they, they, their proof is um, kind of number theoretical. So they show that there is a certain square root of some element. It's very tricky, it's very nice, very nice proof. Uh, and it's very general under this hypothesis. <clears throat> okay. Giovanni, I'm sorry, is it clear yeah. that G sigma preserves X delta? Sorry, G sigma? Is it clear that the group G sigma preserves- on ah, X delta, X yes, because of one. Uh, let's see. So you mean that if delta of X is X, X. Uh, then G applied to X, uh, 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 yes, 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 yes. I see. So you are saying that if you take G from G sigma, yes, and X from X delta, yes, then the left hand side is delta of G of X, yes. and the right hand side is exactly X. Exactly. So it means that. Uh, no, it's exactly g of x. But g of x, yes. So delta of g of x is g of x. Is g of x. Exactly. Okay. So, so, so g of g x is delta fixed. Very good. Mm -hmm. good. OK. And so one can ask the following question. Is it true for the orbit closure? And um, our motivation to, 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 to look for an answer to this question comes from, as I said, to the study of linear degeneration of symplectic frag variety and uh, to the study of symplectic tunipotent B orbits. And uh, so looking there, in those, in those examples, we found that uh, this is not true in general. So we found a counterexample in the context of counterexample. So the, the answer is no in general. In the context of tunipotent G orbits. And we don't understand really the nature of this counterexample, but for sure this question, the, the answer to this question in this generality is, is no in this generality. And um, now let's let's restrict ourselves to a so to to um, class of X and G where these hypotheses are satisfied. And the class is the following: we take it's what we call symmetric representation variety okay now now i want to be very concrete and i want to specialize the, the theory to the case of interest for us because uh, <clears throat> But I want to, to give just a, an overview, okay, for the for the for the and then and then I will I will so the idea here is we have an algebra um, presented by a quiver with relation and the algebra and, and uh, <clears throat> the algebra is uh, endowed with um, um, a linear isomorphism. To, um, to its opposite. And uh, <clears throat> so this induces a self duality. So maybe sigma is not a good letter or. or uh, it's actually one... a good letter. Ah, you mean it's the same? Same yeah. as, as what? Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and then um, 
there is a self-duality on the representation variety of, on the representation category of this algebra. And, uh, and this self-duality in, in uses, uh, so let, let's, let's fix representation variety for this algebra and also um, so the existence of the self duality guarantees that for certain dimension vector there is a um, a self duality in the representation variety I will be very concrete now in a moment <clears throat> so then this is going to be our x and this sigma is basically sending a representation of dimension vector d to its dual. So this is a self duality. So it's basically, this is what. So that's the dual representation. And, um, and, uh, and the group acting here is the group, uh, the structure group of, uh, of the quiver. GD acts there. And there is a, oh yeah, yeah, you're right. I should have called it Delta. Yeah, sorry, absolutely. Yeah, uh, this is okay, no, this is okay. And then um, the Sigma, it's basically so that the fixed points, well, whatever. There is a Sigma there and so, we are in for, for a, an algebra with self duality. We can recreate the situation of Dirksen and by of uh, <clears throat> Magyar, Weiman, and Zelewinski. And uh, and actually, we have a, a new proof of the result of them in this uh, in this context. I'm going to explain precisely. So this year, here, I just want to say that in this context, there is a pair GX as in the theorem. And uh, and then the theorem that I want to present today is the following: that if so, the theorem is if A is of finite type is a finite type and hereditary. Then. The answer is yes. <clears throat> Basically, so so one formulate the the problem that I said in the context of any finite dimensional algebra, and then we just solve it in the first case, which is the case where A is given just by a quiver of finite type, which is just a Dinky quiver with an involution. So that's um, that's the theorem I want to present. All right. So this uh, this problem has relation with the degeneration order for algebras. So let me recall the history a bit of the degeneration order. For finite dimensional algebras. So in RD, there is the action of a group, GD, and then we'll say that M degenerates to N by definition if the orbit of N is contained in the closure of the orbit of M. <clears throat> so M and N are points in this representation variety of a fixed dimension vector. And then it's a classical problem how to describe that, how to describe this closure. Of course, this makes sense only in the case where there are, there are finitely many orbits. So in particular, when A is of finite type. Meaning that the number of in the composable representation is finite. <clears throat> Basically, it's this for a little, okay. And, uh, and the history here is uh, very nice. So it started in the 80s with Abbeasi Stefra. And, 
And they observe that for quivers of type A, for quivers of type A, M degenerates to N if and only if the dimension of the homomorphism from <clears throat> M to E is less or equal than the dimension of the homomorphism from N to E for every in the composable. So, so the, the, the orbit closure is described only by the finite number of inequalities, which depends on the number of in the composable of the quiver. Then this was extended by Rittman for type D Weavers. And then Bongards Uh, he proved that for every algebra which is directed, for every so this well, for for some class of algebras which include, which is much bigger than the class of Dinkin Pivots and uh, it's called representation directed. And this is the paper that I mentioned at the beginning. That's, uh, this is very important paper of Bonkers. And then Zvara prove it for every, for every A, for every algebra of finite type. So for every algebra of finite type, there is this equivalence. The degeneration order is equivalent to this home order. And um, so I think in the context of symmetric representation theory, we are basically here <laughs> to the to Abbasis del Fra. And um, so I hope that that we can get through the other steps. <clears throat> okay. Okay, very good. So let's again. Be the thinking diagram of type A. Let sigma be the involution on AN. And uh, <clears throat> let us fix uh, Q, uh, symmetric orientation. So <clears throat> orientation of A N such that there is an arrow from I to J. And sigma of this arrow is goes from sigma j to sigma i. So that's the, the anti-involution on Q. So for example, this is okay. Equivalent equivalence is uh, okay, but this one is not okay. Because uh, alpha goes from one to two, but sigma alpha goes from sigma one to sigma two. I want the other, okay? Right, so now let me Let's fix B.
Q0 graded vector space, complex space, vector space, and uh, assume that there is a bilinear form. Such that it's non degenerate. Therefore, restricted to bi times bj is zero if i is different from sigma j. Third condition, the form is an epsilon form. So fix epsilon one or minus one, and then assume that the form is an epsilon form. So let's look at this uh, at, at condition two. So condition two means that V sigma i is isomorphic to the dual, to the linear dual of V i. So this form identifies V one with V n, V two with V n minus one and so on by duality. And this condition on epsilon that is always one and minus one, uh, well, uh, it's just because I'm interested in uh, symplectic and orthogonal thing, but it, it, one can do the theory in a more general context, I think. Okay. And now the object I'm interested in is uh, the representation representation variety uh, of Q of, of with underlying vector space V. This is just the direct sum of the homomorphism from V i to V j, and I j is an R of Q. So this is the representation of all the representations of Q with underlying vector space V. <clears throat> all right. And then I say that, uh, so uh, for definition, M in RQV is an epsilon representation. If um, so, if uh, M plus is zero, where this M cross is the joint. Back to the bilinear form. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of fancy, but I'm just saying that M alpha V W plus V M sigma alpha W is zero. For every V in VI and for every W, let's see, in sigma J and for every alpha from I to J. So I, I, so M is a collection of maps. So then I can consider this M as an um, endomorphism of V by putting the, the maps as block matrices. And then, uh, and then this is just their joint. So M is an endomorphism of V, and then since the form is non-degenerate, one can consider their joint of M with respect to that form. And that's that's just the condition that I want M to, to lie in the Lie algebra of the of the group of isometry of V with respect to this form. Okay. 
Okay, so that's that's the variety. That's variety. Right, just maybe one question: Why why you call it yes. epsilon representation? Uh, epsilon representation. So epsilon is hidden in the form. Yes. So epsilon means uh, either if epsilon is one, then it's called orthogonal. If minus one is called simplex. Ah, ah, ah. Okay. Okay. Good. Yes. So right. So so this condition means that M lies in the Lie algebra of the isometry group of B with this non-degenerate form. And so this isometry group is uh, orthogonal or symplectic group. So lying in the Lie algebra, it's been, this is one where the name comes from. So this is this variety here is the variety X. And, <clears throat> and then delta that's M into minus the product of M. So that X delta is the variety we are interested in. The variety of epsilon representations. So that's the context. Okay, so that's X and uh, And now what, what's the, the group? So G is product of GLBI. This acts on X by change of basis. And, <clears throat> and then Sigma And G into a joint inverse, so that the the set of fixed points is precisely a graded isometry group. So that's that's just uh, something like GLV one times GL the n minus one and then times the orthogonal group or the symplectic group because we're just in type a equivalent so it's this uh, is a theta group in the sense of being back uh, but, but in principle the, the last factor may be missing one yeah so i mean if you if you have yes right yes yes absolutely absolutely or there is nothing or nothing absolutely yes in the even case, there is nothing. Okay. Okay, so the theorem is the following. Now take two epsilon representations. And uh, <clears throat> such that GN belongs to the closure of GM. This happens if and only if G sigma N belongs to the closure of G sigma M. So that's, that's the theorem. And uh, the idea of proof is the following. Um, the idea of proof is the following. So one implication, so th this is obvious because, because G sigma is a subgroup of G. <clears throat> so for the other implication, suppose that M degenerates to N. Then find uh, uh, the composition N plus 
x plus the dual. Well, that's the dual of L. Um, such that uh, L embeds into M isotropically. So the first thing is okay, find a decomposition like this where, and also an embedding of L into M, which is isotropic subrepresentation, because here this is isotropic. And then, and then we look at the following diagram. So this is the generic portion. But this diagram is really the key of everything. <laughs> Zero L U, and then since uh, L is isotropic, it embeds it so into its orthogonal. The quotient is the dual. Here there is some Y. So from the fact that L is isotropic, we have this situation. And then, so L is isotropic means that it's contained in the, in the, in the orthogonal. And then show why, why is again an epsilon representation? Because it's the orthogonal modulo L. So it's uh, the form, the restricted there is non-degenerate. And then, show then, then we get Giovanni I'm sorry this L orthogonal it lives where so in M so in V in V so it's a it's a sub vector subspace of V which is invariant by by M so being a sub representation me means being a sub a sub vector subspace of V uh -huh. which is invariant by M uh -huh. okay and the orthogonal is uh, orthogonal, so it's a subspace of V. V has a bilinear form, non-degenerate bilinear form, and then one can consider the orthogonal of this subspace. And that's a, a subrepresentation of M because it's uh, because L is isotropic. Yes, and but what? Why do you know that there exists such a decomposition of M into the direct sum? Oh, yeah, of yeah, M. that's part of the theorem. Ah. Yeah, it's uh, it's not trivial. It's uh, yeah. But ju just the, the logic, it, it follows from your assumption that uh, one representation sits in yes. the closure of the orbit exactly. of the other. Okay. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. It follows from the assumption. Yes. So, sorry, I do, don't really understand. Like you say, M is smaller than N. And yeah, then, so then in the degeneration order. So this means. Uh, it, it's, it's fine. Like, mm -hmm. if N is in the closure of N. Yeah, and then N, uh, M. Then there is the decomposition of N mm -hmm. in such a way that one summand is isotropic in N and it, it embeds into M and is isotropic into M as well. Ah, I see. Okay. Then, then we have a diagram like this. And then M degenerates. Uh, uh, as an epsilon representation to what? To L plus its dual plus Y. So here one, in, in such a situation, one can construct a one parameter subgroup that bring, which sits inside the small group of uh, isometries that brings them into here. Okay. So that's another general fact that in such situation there is such a degeneration inside the small group. So that's the second key point of the proof. 
And the third key point is choose I choose I so that Y degenerates to X. As, as queer representations, not, not as uh, epsilon representations. And then conclude by induction. So that's the idea. And uh, <clears throat> so, so this, this step is uh, based on Bongard's uh, cancellation theorem. Uh, this this uh, is a new new result. Not, not I mean it's a, well it's a sufficient criterion for the generation as a, of epsilon representations. And this is really hard. So this is the kind of interesting part of the proof. It's really uh, well nice. <laughs> Yes, so so that's that's uh, what I wanted to say. Uh, yeah, thank you. If I it wasn't so, yeah. Uh, sorry if I wasn't too like detailed, but unfortunately my board is not so big. So thanks again for the invitation and for your attention. So I would say I finish here. Thank you very much. Uh, and so Giovanni. Uh, uh, is your proof so is it a proof for type a or this is a general claim it's only for type a uh -huh. because for other dinking quivers there, there is no such asymmetry oh. so so the only connected uh, dinking quiver which have uh, we having the sigma is uh, type a otherwise the others are you take a quiver and it's uh, and it's opposite but in that case uh, the, the theorem is obvious because the, the other the, the group acts on the other copy by contra gradient action so everything is determined by one single copy so but, the, but the orientation does not matter is that right yeah for if you take type d for example uh, then there is no orientation of type d no no no, no. i mean that in type a so your, your proof works for any orientation of type a but, for uh, it works for every orientation which is compatible with sigma mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because otherwise there is no bilinear form i see i see i see mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so in particular it works for a oriented quiver of type a mm -hmm. yeah So in particular, so do you understand? So I mean, in the uh, just classical situation, this degeneration order can be described very explicitly. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, you just take all the composition maps. Ah, no, no, this is only for for the yeah, yeah. For, for every rented, you just take the rank of the composition. Yeah, and then but just even, compare. Right? Yeah, even in that case, proving this theorem, I mean, is maybe easier. But for example, one of the tricks we use for the third part is based on uh, careful analysis of type equivalent type A quiver. Mm -hmm. And there is a point where, I mean, you have to, to work. It's not, even in that case, the proof is not completely trivial, but you are right in type A. At least just, just understand the statement. So you are saying that, so let us stay in this equivalent case. Yes, yes? absolutely. Then, yes. then you, are, you are saying that the, degeneration for these epsilon representations can also be kind of read off from the ranks of the composition maps right absolutely uh -huh. yes it's equivalent to the rank to the rank ordering uh -huh. yes but i didn't find this statement in the literature even for type a equivalent i don't know So actually, if someone of you has seen this before, please let me know. Yeah, because uh, and as I said, even in that case, it's uh, it's not trivial. I mean, it's maybe easier a bit, but not so much easier. When it's uh, I mean, uh, our proof is based on the analysis of the Auslander Leiden quiver of this. Uh, I mean, 
yeah, we use a lot of the self the right and fever, and we, we give an explicit description of this why. So that, that takes the most of the most of part, most part of the proof. How to describe why, and then prove that why the J raised to X by looking at the home order. So that the homomorphism from Y to E is less or equal to the homomorphism from X to E for every E in the composable. So it's, uh, yeah. But, uh, but, I, but I believe that um, our proof works for every directed algebra. I think with some effort more should be true for directed algebras. Hmm. Yes, so, so I think there is a lot to do here and so I encourage you to, to look at it, yes, if you want. <laughs> So I, I would be very I, happy to discuss about that. So. Yeah, I have my questions, more questions, but maybe somebody else wants to ask something. Mm -hmm. well, may, may I ask, like, again, about the decomposition? So you wrote N is L plus X plus L dual. Yes. Decomposition of vector spaces or quiver representation. It's, it's a decomposition so, of, it of, of, of vector quiver representation. Of queer representations, yeah. Thank you. Yes, it's a, it's a decomposition of queer representations, and uh, it's also a decomposition of epsilon representations. So the form mm. on n is equal to the form on l plus l dual, and the form on x. So it's um, but that there is a decomposition of queer representations, and actually l we we assume l is indecomposable. Yeah, actually, it's, it's a bit a bit counterintuitive for me. Like, usually, expansion can degenerate to direct sum, and here n is already direct sum. So what's going on? Like, yeah. uh, well, because in that category there is a Krull-Schmidt uh, theorem, so every representation can be decomposed into some direct sum of indecomposables. Mm -hmm. And here, uh, what I'm, ju I'm just saying that there is, a, there is one in the composable direct sum of n, which embeds into m, mm -hmm. and in such a way that the embedding is isotropic, isotropic. Yeah, yeah, but like in m, it is not a direct sum. No, 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 no. Ah, very good question. No, no, in general, it's not. Absolutely not. No, it's just a sub-representation. So it like n is ah ah oh I see you you're ordering okay I, I, okay I just n n is uh, smaller than m so n is in the closure of m ah okay 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 great Thank and you. then there is a result of Bongers that says that you can find such an l in the composable which embeds into m. Mm -hmm. And our work is only to prove that you can choose the embedding so that it's isotropic. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank yeah, so that's the first part of the theorem. It's uh, it's it's a proof really given by hands somehow. Really, we work a lot. See? Ah, ciao, Val. Si, 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 adesso arrivo. Okay, grazie. You have to leave or you have? Uh, yeah, I actually have to leave because uh, it was today. It's really a mess. <laughs> I'm teaching like yeah, crazy, and there are meetings, and yeah, you have no idea. I mean, that's not. Uh, but I'm very happy that I found at least this one hour to talk about that with you. And thanks, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's really okay. great. Okay. Thank you very much, Giovanni. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks for. Okay. Bye, Evgeny. So maybe we discuss at some point. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Okay. Bye. Bye, Lena. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.